we gave them unconditional acceptance and love and nurturement. That was otherwise they would have been massacred at the beach. When the English first came, my father was a great man and the English a little child. He constrained other Indians from harming the English. He gave the English corn and showed them how to plant. He let them have a hundred times more land than now I have for my own people. King Philip, Wampanoag. Welcome to Literary Hangover. I'm your host, Matt Leck. With me is Alex Guns. Hello. And Grace. Hi. Grace, do we want to be using your last name? Or? Oh, sure. Grace Jackson. Grace Jackson. Grace Trump. Um, today we are talking about a story called the sovereignty and goodness of god or a narrative of the captivity and restoration of mrs mary rowlinson it's sort of the first bestseller in american history um it was published in 1682 and uh details the captivity of Mary Rowlandson during what uh, is called King Philip's War or Metacomet's Rebellion, King Philip and Metacomet being the same person. And so we're going to go into the background of that a little bit. King Philip's War, the dates for that are 1675 to 1678. So it's I, I've been thinking about it in sort of the wake of the Pequot War. Pequot War, which was 1636 to 1638, so 40 years earlier. And a lot of the lessons are sort of learned, or that have been learned by the Native Americans are, one, um, you know, as King Philip said in that section from the documentary 500 Nations, that when the pilgrims came to the States, when they came to America, uh, they met with Massasoit, who uh, a Wampanoag chief who was there at Thanksgiving, or the original Thanksgiving. And Massasoit maintained peace for uh, a number of years. Like, uh, Actually, we have some of that. I'm just going to play that. King Philip's dad. Uh, yep, exactly. Yeah. For almost 40 years, while the Plymouth colony rapidly expanded, Massasoit maintained peace between his Wampanoag and the English. The Massasoit of the Wampanoag Nation, he was a magnificent peacekeeper. And that 50 years of peace um, maintained between us and the English um, was really due to his, um, his intelligence, integrity, um, and love for the people. By the time of Massasoit's death in 1660, a new generation had risen to power in Plymouth. They had long forgotten his generosity. Leadership passed to Massasoit's 24-year-old son, Philip. He would become known as King Philip. But then when Philip took over, he was a different sort of a person. He was going to fight to the end for his people. In 1662, when King Philip came to power, the growing colonies held 50,000 residents. In New England, Indian nations found themselves surrounded. Their agricultural lands shrinking, many Wampanoag were left with little choice but to work for the English as laborers and servants. But it wasn't just land and liberty they were losing. Their culture and traditions were also under attack. The English, they thought of Wampanoags as inferior from the, all the way around, from a standpoint, especially the religion. And then as a people, they were savages. I want to play some clips from God, War, and Providence, uh, the epic struggle of Roger Williams and the Narragansett Indians against the Puritans of New England. Uh, I use this uh, in for the Pequot War episode, and it's a really good book. I highly recommend it. M- one of the best I've read on uh, the 17th century colonies. And uh, this goes into uh, a little bit more detail about uh, the sort of dynamic we were just hearing about. We have no way of knowing when Philip first seriously entertained the idea of leading a pan-Indian rebellion against the English. It may have been as early as 1671. 
In March of that year, a crisis developed when Philip refused to respond to a summons Smith court to answer a complaint about a rumored Narragansett Wampanoag conspiracy. When Hugh Cole, an agent of the court, was sent out to Mount Hope to bring Philip in for questioning, he observed many Indians around Mount Hope, generally employed, as he put it in his report, in making bows and arrows and fixing guns. Philip declined to show up for questioning. Fear of war spread rapidly through the colony. Medicom was summoned yet again, this time urgently, to the town of Taunton. The proud sachem arrived with a band of warriors armed with traditional weapons as well as muskets, their faces painted. They were met by armed Plymouth militiamen. Taunts were exchanged. Tensions were so high that a skirmish was only narrowly averted. Under duress and seething with humiliation, Philip signed a document acknowledging the naughtiness in my heart. Puritan sources claim he further agreed to surrender all of his people's guns, but historians dispute this claim. The Indians at the meeting surrendered their weapons grudgingly, but hundreds of other Wampanoags retained theirs, leading to festering tensions and on-again, off-again talk of war throughout the summer. Then, on September 24, 1671, the governors of both Massachusetts and Connecticut joined Plymouth officials in a vain attempt to sort out the cluster of disagreements festering between the Wampanoags and Plymouth Colony. The meeting, opines historian Douglas Edward Leach, was conducted almost as though it were a criminal trial, with Philip at the bar of justice. The English leveled a host of charges against Philip. He had violated the Treaty of Taunton by failing to turn over all his men's guns. He had carried himself insolently toward Plymouth's authorities by refusing to appear when called to court. He had harbored Indians who were Plymouth's professed enemies. The list went on at some length. With the full weight of the United Colonies against him, Philip was forced to sign yet another document, this one far more humiliating than the Treaty of Taunton, for it required him, for the first time, to recognize all the Wampanoag people as subjects of Plymouth Colony. He was also obliged to surrender all the arms in the tribe's possession, pay a fine of one hundred pounds, and pay annual tribute of five wolves' heads to the colony government as a sign of that subjection. After being forced into signing away the last vestiges of Wampanoag autonomy, Philip probably felt he had little choice but to begin to plan in earnest to go to war against Plymouth. The Wampanoag sachem soon sold off virtually every scrap of Indian land at his disposal and used the cash to surreptitiously replenish the tribe's arsenal of weapons. He also entered into extended discussions with neighboring sachems about rising up against Puritan domination. You're go- they're making you sell these lands anyway. Put that money right towards weapons. Weaponry. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh. Some of that short-term thinking, I guess. <laughs> War was never far from Philip's mind, for it seems he had now concluded that without a radical shift in the balance of power between English and Indian peoples, his sachemdom was doomed. This realization, shared as it was by a good number of other sachems, and by a majority of young Indian males in their late teens and twenties among all the tribes, more than any single event or series of events, was the primary cause of King Philip's war. Um, yeah, and and then we I'll have play a little bit more from earlier in this book about the uh, the sort of broader economics behind it. Relations between the Wampanoags and Plymouth began to show signs of serious strain in the mid 1660s. More so than in any other colony, Puritan expansion and prosperity seemed to come directly at the Indians' expense in Plymouth. With a market for furs and wampum in precipitous decline, the Wampanoags were forced to purchase European-made goods with cash obtained by selling the only commodity they had that was in high demand, land. As noted in the last chapter, the value of land in New England in the 1660s was increasing rapidly, but the government of Plymouth prohibited Philip from selling land to the highest bidder on an open market. Instead, he could sell only to the colony government, and then invariably at a price well below what the markets would bear. Speculators in Plymouth grew rich by purchasing large tracts of former Indian lands from the government and reselling them at double or triple the original buying price. In the 1630s and 1640s, the Wampanoags had ample lands to accommodate the needs of Indian and Puritan alike, but the rapid rise in the English population created an almost insatiable appetite for land. By the mid-1660s, the children of the first generation of settlers were clamoring for farms for their own families. They wanted those farms as close as possible to the original settlements. Soon after he became sachem in 1662, Philip and the Plymouth government agreed to a seven-year embargo on Indian land sales, but the tribe's urgent need for cash, coupled with the rise in demand for Indian lands, put an end to the embargo. Between 1650 and 1659, 14 deeds to Wampanoag land were registered in Plymouth's court. Between 1665 and 1675, 76 such deeds were registered. 
Pushed south to the neck of Mount Hope, Philip and his people were hemmed in from every side, writes historian Nathaniel Philbrick. Even the simplified, supposedly woke narrative about this is a land stolen by conquest misses how much capitalism has to do with all this. Like, right. and, and real estate capitalism specifically, right? Yeah. Like, they're selling their land on a market. This is, isn't all, all done by, like, um, building forts and, you know, moving people out. There's a legal veneer over all of this. Yeah. Um, there's, there's definitely a sense of laying the track as the train is coming. Uh, of They're just like, well, like, the idea of building a nation state like America when the idea of a nation is being hammered out in Europe at that time is kind of lost on the narrative now that mm. it's creating its own story as it's going on in a very, very violent way. Yeah. We'll go back to a God war on Providence for what's the, the precipitating event of the, of King Philip's war or Metacomet's rebellion. And uh, I should mention this is by James A. Warren. I'm not a hundred percent sure if I did or not earlier. Just what was all the trouble in Plymouth about? The Indian uprising, known today as King Philip's War, was the result of a slow but steady deterioration in English-Indian relations generally, but in Plymouth the situation was particularly acute. The first violence was sparked by the Plymouth government's execution of three of Philip's men on June 8, 1675, for the murder of a prominent Christian Indian named John Sassaman. In January 1675, Sassaman, a model convert who had briefly attended Harvard College and served as a preacher in the Christian Indian community at Natick, had informed Governor Josiah Winslow that the Wampanoags were planning an imminent uprising against the English. Reports of such plots were not uncommon, and the governor seems to have taken no immediate action upon receiving the news, even though Sassaman was clearly sincere when he remarked that he feared for his life in revealing the plot. He was right to be afraid. At the end of January, Sassamon's body was discovered under pond ice about 15 miles southwest of Plymouth by a group of Indians. They buried the body, but a witness later came forward claiming he had seen three Wampanoag Indians kill Sassamon and place him under the ice. An inquest was launched by the magistrates. The body, when exhumed, showed unmistakable signs of foul play. The head was badly swollen and the neck had been broken. The witness, a Christian Indian named Patuxen, identified the killers as Tobias, one of Philip's chief counselors, his son Wampampaquan, and another Wampanoag man named Matashunamo. The record has far too many gaps for us to ever know for sure who killed Sasamon, but the circumstantial evidence makes a compelling case that Philip had ordered his execution. Sassamon had, after all, accused Philip of an offense for which the Sachem might well have been executed by the English authorities. What's more, several years earlier, Sassamon, while serving as Philip's scribe, had deviously inserted himself into Philip's will as beneficiary of a large plot of land and been caught in the act. Mm. He had been forced to flee Mount Hope and seek protection from the English authorities overseeing the Christian Indian communities. Philip flatly denied any personal culpability for Sassamon's death, at least to the Plymouth authorities. Moreover, he was utterly incensed that Plymouth intended to prosecute the case under English law. Since no English people were involved as victims or alleged perpetrators, and the crime had happened on Indian territory, the case should have been left for the Wampanoags to adjudicate. The magistrates, who had let few opportunities to humble Philip or disparage his authority slip by since he had assumed power, were having none of it. The three suspects were tried by a jury of twelve Englishmen, assisted in their work by six praying Indians who had no vote in the matter, and summarily found guilty. They were hanged on June 8th. The trial raised an issue in Philip's mind that had come to symbolize Plymouth's flagrant disregard for his authority, the colony's active support of missionary efforts among the Wampanoags. It had begun in earnest in 1616 when the minister John Cotton, Jr. began to preach to Plymouth's Indians regular none of it. The three suspects were tried by twelve Englishmen, assisted in their work by six praying Indians who had no vote in the matter, and summarily found guilty. They were hanged on June 8th. The trial raised an issue in Philip's mind that had come to symbolize Plymouth's flagrant disregard for his authority, the colony's active support of missionary efforts among the Wampanoags. It had begun in earnest in 1667 when the minister John Cotton, Jr. began to preach to Plymouth's Indians regularly. Two of the key figures in the trial, Sassaman and Patuxen, were Christians. Philip despised the missionary program, as it inevitably led to the defection of Indians from his sachemdom. Sassaman was a, another praying Indian. And it's interesting, that there's going to be two of those that we're talking about. And it, there's sort of um, a... It's not a... It, the outlook isn't that great if you're one of these... Um, 
uh, a Native American who's trying to assimilate. You mm-hmm. know, as we heard in the um, Hope Leslie a historical context uh, with the the Trail of Tears, right? Like you're often signing treaties, you you know, leading to dispossession, and then you get killed for it, or you, you know, like you get blamed for stuff, or you're actually just a traitor. This this Sassaman. John Sassaman, born about 1620, around the first uh, Thanksgiving, uh, died 1675, of course, at the start of the war. It's believed he was raised in the home of a fur trader, Richard Callicott. He was mentored by John Elliott, who was a guy who uh, was sort of uh, associated with Harvard and the uh, Harvard Indian School and also the early Harvard University Press. And they made a bunch of these Indian Bibles. And John L., uh, John Sassamon, and who we'll meet later, uh, James Printer, uh, who's actually in the Mary Rowlandson narrative, they both worked with this John Eliot who uh, made the Bibles. Yeah, so the Harvard Indian College had this uh, this press that a lot of these guys worked at. Yeah, th- this is from the uh, Harvard Indian College's Wikipedia. The building was also used to house the first printing press in the English colonies. Mm. The printing press was housed in the building until 1692 when the steward of the Cambridge Press, Samuel Green, died. Under the missionary John Eliot's direction, in 1663, the college printed a translation of the Bible into Massachusetts language, which was the first Bible in any language printed in British North America. James Printer, an Algonquin-speaking nipmunk who converted to Christianity, did much of the translation and typesetting. James Printer is, uh, we'll find out, plays a big role in the Mary Rowlandson saga. He's another praying Indian. like uh, That's obviously why he's associated with James Eliot. So John Sassaman was actually at Harvard before there was even a Harvard Indian school. So he, was wow. just, he just attended Harvard. And uh, he may have fought along uh, with the colonists in the Pequot War. And there's a story of... Actually, well, I'll just play this bit from Jill Lepore. I will say, uh, I wasn't a big fan of Jill Lepore's most recent book, These Truths. I think it's just too broad. And I don't know. I thought her stuff on recent history wasn't that... Wasn't that um, I don't know. Uh, perceptive. But um, it's just... it's She's just rehashing Angela Nagel. Um, on like campus PC stuff, um, which I didn't see. The King Philip's War of its time. Yeah, exactly. Like it didn't. It's like why is this in here? <laughs> We're doing. You're doing a one volume history of the United States, and this yeah. shit's in here. Um, <laughs> <sighs> Sounds like you were triggered, Matt. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so here's a bit on John Sassaman from well, this book. Um, is very good though. Uh, made me a fan of Jillipore. On its, I should just give the name. The Name of War, uh, King Philip's War and the Origins of American Identity. So uh, I believe this was her first big history. And here's a bit on Sassaman. Divers of whom can read English and begin to understand in their measure the grounds of Christian religion. As an orphaned Indian raised in an English home, John Sassaman would have learned to speak and even to read and write English at a relatively young age. He was probably in his teens when his parents died. By 1637 Sassamon had evidently demonstrated his civility and subjection well enough to serve as an interpreter and to fight on the colonists' side during the war against the Pequot Indians. 31 Sassamon, the Indian served with Sergeant Richard Callicott of Dorchester and may have been the interpreter Captain John Underbill described in his account of the war. We had an Indian with us that was an interpreter, Underhill wrote. One day, a group of Pequots noticed this man, who was in English clothes, and a gun in his hand, and called out to him, What are you, an Indian or an Englishman? Come hither, he shouted back, and I will tell you. As soon as the curious Pequots came within range, the interpreter pulls up his cock and let fly at one of them, and without question was the death of him. John Sassaman might have had it coming. I mean, unquestionably, <laughs> an action movie scene that's a travesty that has not been made. I mean, like, it's... Are you an Indian or are you, or are you Englishman? Like come and find out oh i would unload on them (laughs) i would love to adapt um this entire period of history for like a hbo miniseries if they're listening but uh because there is there it is amazing like that scene like are you indian or what was it english or i'm not sure what it was but are you englishman or are you an indian 
and th- like that's a deep question yeah, to yeah, ask yeah. somebody, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and then for him to respond by being like, "Come on," <laughs> and then shoot, you're like, "Oh, well, this seems it character." Oh, and then he's like, "I'm American." That's <laughs> characterization. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he drives off in his Corvette. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Didn't King Philip also go to Harvard? King Philip also went to Harvard. Yes, that's right. It's very interesting. This is just like an Ivy League fight, then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh yeah, so that so John Sassaman, uh, he was found dead in that in Assawampset Pond on January twenty ninth, uh, sixteen seventy five. This was after he warned the Plymouth governor about Metacomet's plans. His neck was broke, and uh, there was no water in his lungs. There's some debate as to you know they, who was really responsible, or could it have been an accident? Uh, because uh, the Native Americans didn't often hide that they were responsible for deaths. They would sometimes put mark- symbolic markings claiming responsibility. Um, but uh, it, it generally, it seems as if uh, it, King Philip did order it. And King Philip um, should be said, like his arc is, uh, you can see why he was pretty pissed off, uh, cheesed off with the, uh, with the columnist. So, yeah, his famous words, I've had it. Well, his brother was killed, died in English hands. It seemed like he was sick and he was, he, his brother took over um, a, a sort of leadership position after, his, after Massasoit died. And, but that only lasted like a year or two when uh, his brother was like negotiating something with the, the, the English and they gave him a purgative to try to help him with something, but King Philip thought they poisoned him. And uh, it's that's sort of unclear, too. Maybe they did just kill him. Who knows? Um, that's interesting, given that one of the objections I think King Philip had to colonial rule was that there were laws in place that proscribed um, Indian medicine being mm. used. Hmm. Yeah, and part of the 500 Nations thing, they like they were literally regulating women's, uh, like Native American women's menstruation. So, oh, like, my God. Like... Um, cycles like they apparently native american women like to go out into the forests or something um and have like some sort of monthly Ritual. period yeah and the puritans like you need to work like <laughs> actually <laughs> but not on the sabbath yeah, yeah. yeah. The which privy is, needs building which actually that comes up in rowlinson too she wants to keep the sabbath uh, oh yeah clean and uh, so that's like, actually let's move on Rightfully to marked. mary rowlinson's uh yeah, they said, we'll smash your face, I believe, is the quote. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's... So modern. That. Yeah. The, that's a, there's a few modern touches. Um, she also calls their food trash. Yeah, yeah. Um, filthy the Beggars trash. can be filthy choosers. Trash, yeah. It's incredible. I love her food journey. Yeah, they're eating bark. Delicious. Um, <laughs> so, I also... I don't know if I've played anything from this specifically, but this is another one of my favorite uh, sources. This is Regeneration oh. Through Violence, The Mythology of the American Frontier, 1600 to 1860, by Richard Slotkin. And uh, obviously talks a lot about the uh, captivity narrative um, here. And I'll play this little bit, which goes into uh, Mary Rowlandson's the narrative of it and how it sort of created a genre that was the dominant genre of early American uh, literature. Mm. The first captivity narratives were genuine, first-person accounts of actual ordeals, and for that reason it is possible to view the genre as a natural, spontaneous product of the New World experience. However, Puritan ministers and men of letters were quick to realize the polemical and theological potential in the tales and began to exercise direct control over the composition of the narratives, shaping them for their own ends. Under their hands, the genre became very flexible, serving, often simultaneously, as literary entertainment, material for revival sermons, vehicle for political diatribes, and experimental evidence in philosophical and theological works. The great and continuing popularity of these narratives, the uses to which they were put, and the nature of the symbolism employed in them are evidence that the captivity narratives constitute the first coherent myth literature developed in America for American audiences. The nature and extent of the captivity narrative's popularity is attested by the fact that they completely dominate the list of frontier narratives published in America between 1680 and 1716, Zero replacing narratives of soldierly exploits in the sermon narrative literature too it almost seems as if the only experience of intimacy with the Indians that New England readers would accept was the experience of the captive, and possibly that of the missionary. Even after 1720 the tales of captivity continued to be popular, although they shared the market with other types of narrative, 
and the first tentative American efforts at short fiction and the first American novel, Brown's Edgar Huntley, were very much in the vein of the captivity narratives. Mary Rowland's son S. The Sovereignty and Goodness of God. A narrative of the captivity and restoration was the first and by far the most widely distributed book devoted to a single captivity. It was printed first in Boston in 1682 and as the true history of the captivity went through two other editions, in Cambridge and London, that same year. These separate Zero Land promotion brochures and legal documents also appeared in profusion throughout the period but did not have the imaginative charge of the narrative literature. 96 regeneration through violence editions were not only testimony to the book's extraordinary popularity, they also ensured its wide distribution in England and in the colonies. Colonial printing of Indian war literature during this period was largely restricted to the Boston area presses and the London presses. It was from the latter that books were distributed to England and the southerly colonies, while Boston served eastern New England. Mrs. Roland Sun's work continued to be popular for a century and a half. It was reissued in Boston in 1720, 1770, two editions, 1771, and 1773, in New London in 1773, and frequently thereafter in various colonies and states well into the 19th century. Another popular early narrative was John Williams's The Redeemed Captive, an account of his captivity among the French Indians in Canada. It was published in Boston in 1706 by Cotton Mather himself, in an edition that was hastily and badly printed to meet the immediate demand for it, it sold 1,000 copies in a week. Its popularity also was long-lived, it was reissued in Boston in 1707, 1720, 1758, 1774, and 1776 and in New London in 1773. Of the four narrative works which attained the status of bestseller between 1680 and 1720, three were captivity narratives, the fourth was Pilgrim's Progress. Not until the 19th century did a novel gain similar popularity. Point three, but popularity alone is not the best sign by which to recognize the presence of a myth. More relevant is testimony to the power of the captivity narratives to express the community's sense of the meaning of its experience, to rationalize its actions, and to move its people to new actions. The captivities were presented in sermon narrative form, each beginning with a biblical text and prefaced by a doctrine section in which the moral principles demonstrated in the narrative were defined and offered to the reader as a lesson and a warning to reform his life. Mrs. Roland Sun's narrative, for example, was offered to her dear children and relations for the purpose of reminding them of their religious duties. Cotton Mather used the narrative of Hannah Dustin's escape from captivity as the core of a series of revival sermons in 1694, attempting to invoke in the backslidden younger generation the religious consciousness of the Puritan fathers by recounting this myth of the Puritan experience. Even the writings that emerged from the witch hysteria of 16G2 derived images and narrative patterns from the captivities. Re that should be... That should have said 1692. A lot of those that were numbers or dates, the text to speech uh, software doesn't nail those exactly mm -hmm. yet. But um, yeah, I, I, I thought that was interesting about how, how one that's sort of the, there'd obviously be a lot of curiosity about Native Americans, but the one, the, the only ways you're going to hear about that is through captivity narratives for, written by people who obviously didn't want to leave because if somebody wanted to go live with them, uh, they wouldn't be allowed back to write a, a narrative yeah. about it. When kids were brought back from captivity, they'd have to keep them sort of on a leash so they didn't return back to the Native American tribes, uh, that lifestyle. that There wasn't, and that wasn't symmetrical. Some good context are when I was reading excerpts like that. You think of like 1600s American colonies selling 1,700 copies of this. Mm -hmm. Think of 200 years later when America's far more industrialized, probably quadruple the population at least, and Moby Dick can't even sell that many copies. Yeah, like mm. at least twice as many. Like that's how the idea that for colonists to look at us now and the fact that we're not talking about it all the time must be so al would be so alien to them. Right. And I really like Slotkin's idea that these narratives were so powerful because they were a, a way for um, the Puritan population to have a safe, quote-unquote, safe encounter with the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And that it was a kind of culturally um, sanctioned and safe way for them to interface with what was all around them and what they found so threatening. But I think in the context of this particular narrative... Um, it's even more interesting because I think Mary Rowlandson actually disrupts the very clear delineation between her captors and herself. Mm -hmm. 
I think throughout the narrative, you can see her kind of having these very visceral embodied experiences, especially with food that take her kind of perilously close to their way of life right. and to sort of integrating somewhat into it. So I think it's kind of a double edged sword in that respect. Yeah. There is like a certain level of vice that like the state is allowing for people to indulge in by reading this because you can't help but feel like there's a certain level of like indulgence in the violence, like the description of the violence of their kinsmen mm. that some part of them must know that like there has to be a pressure release valve for like fellow colonists to enjoy this <laughs> on some level. So like this narrative of escape and adventure also wallows in like just the pornography of violence yeah. i feel like and you can also read it as a travelogue in yeah <laughs> in some ways um, oh yeah i mean it's literally broken down into movements like yeah. this is the this is where we move this time <laughs> that is, is where, true and yeah. yet you never really get a good description of the landscape no that was no. something i found very interesting in this is that she's not really interested in the external world she's really on an inward spiritual journey basically through hell um, yeah yeah in um in, in remove uh 10 and 11 uh let's see here it's almost like the impulse is like a um like a an ancestor like an ur movement towards like true crime hmm. the, the same kind of idea of like i just want to know the like grisly violence of it all yeah oh and, no it's in the seventh remove where she talks about uh um like the only time she met, she mentions um, sort of environmental things is when she's talking about we went to this uh, town that was abandoned that the Indians were were going to stay in for the night, or in uh, the seventh day here she says, um, as we went along I saw a place where English cattle had been that was a comfort to me such as it was quickly after that we came to an English path which so took with me that I thought I could have freely lined down and died. Um, like just the English path, like, mm. like seeing that is like, oh my gosh, there's a sign of, you know, my like culture or something. Yeah. yeah the yeah. landscape somewhat domesticated as yeah. well mm-hmm. by a yeah. trailblazing Englishman. <laughs> hmm. Oh yeah. This goes into a little bit more of the historical impact of the uh, captivity experience. Several identifiable factors brought about the development of the captivity mythology, shaped its course, and gave it its special character and direction. The prime source of its peculiar concerns and images is the psychological condition of the Puritans, their theory of human psychology, and their therapeutic rituals designed for dealing with states of mind or soul. The accuracy with which the captivities reflected this Puritan psychology gave them their great popularity and made them viable as components in Puritan sermons and other rituals, for this reason, discussion of the captivities must center around an analysis of their psychology. Other factors, however, conspired with psychology to make the captivities the starting point of an American mythology, especially the historical circumstances of the Indian Wars and the deliberate intervention of conscious artists, notably Cotton Mather, representatives of the Puritan ruling classes in the process of myth-making. The historical impact of the captivity experience on the New England mind can be suggested by a brief glance at the statistics of captivity and the reports of captives' fates that circulated in New England. Emma Lewis Coleman's New England Captives Carried to Canada, published in 1925, list some 750 individual captivities between 1677 and 1750, and there is little doubt that this represents less than half of the total number of captives. Only those who were carried all the way to Canada and integrated. G8 regeneration through violence into French-Canadian society are listed, since only these appear in Canadian records. Hundreds of children and women, and some men, who vanished into Indian villages have never been traced, and these were more likely than the Canadian captives to remain in captivity for life or to accept adoption into a tribe. Moreover, the inefficiency of colonial record-keeping, especially before 1700, makes it impossible to identify all those taken from New England villages. Other statistics indicate that two were captured for every name that was recorded. Of the 750 whose names and fates are known, 300 were ransomed and returned to New England after captivities ranging from 6 months to 20 years. 21 captives were returned to the English after longer stays among the Indians and French. Of the remaining captives, 92 were killed in captivity, and more than 100 disappeared after brief stays in Canada either dead, or escaped to other colonies, or carried into the deep woods by the Indians. 150 captives were converted to Roman Catholicism, 13 eventually returned to New England, most of them married, and a substantial number of the women became nuns. No fewer than 6-0 of the captives became Indians outright, 
and many of those listed as long-term captives were noted for their retention of Indian habits after their return. From the viewpoint of New England, then, Indian captivity was almost certain to result in spiritual and physical catastrophe. The captives either vanished forever into the woods, or returned half-Indianized or Romanized, or converted to Catholicism and stayed in Canada, or married some Canadian half-breed or Indian slut, or went totally savage. In any of these cases, the captive was a soul utterly lost to the tents of the English Israel. Another reason for the success of the captivity as an archetype of the American experience lies in its aptness as an expression of the Puritans' anxieties about their social and spiritual position. They had left England voluntarily, although exhorted to remain, to compensate they had resisted, to the best of their ability, the tendency to acculturate to the Indian way of life fostered by the wilderness. Now the anxiety occasioned by their leaving ancestral England was being borne out by their American-born children, just as they themselves had left the ways of their parents and grandparents, so the children were growing up strangers to their parents' culture. The fathers had sharpened their piety in England on the persecutions by Anglican prelates and the hot gospeling of an evangelical age, their children suffered no such persecution, and the fervor of their piety was markedly less. It was as if the sin of the first generation against their own English parents were being visited upon them. I don't know about you two, but reading this and probably go into it more as like the narrative goes on, but I couldn't help comparing this to like the only other example of like watching a war run up in real life, which was the Iraq invasion and how different and in my opinion, how much more successful this is as like a piece of propaganda for its own time than mm. the Bush administration's attempt to like convince people that this is going to be a good idea. Yeah. That it, sh- it had good short term success, but like bottomed out after three years where this is like the recipe for something that could last like generations, I think. You mean reading this document as like a justification for yeah. genocide? And yeah, I think it, it puts colonists in the correct mindset for like that the war, like if you're an imperial power, the war never ends. And like our presence is to keep shit like this from happening to you, like to scare you. Whereas, you know, like, I feel like the Iraq invasion like had all these goals that people were expecting, like, well, we're going to go in and they're going to have a democracy and they're going to be America too in like two years. And when none of that happened, you could just, you just watch the, the support for it evaporate. That might have been like actually their biggest mistake, really. And the weapons of mass destruction lies. Yeah. Like instead, just like they should just release stuff like this constantly. They almost had it like with like the war on terror, just like, yeah, you could, a building could blow up at any moment. Basically, that's why we have to do whatever we want. Yeah. I mean, the thing to, that needs to be mentioned when you go through these stats of how many people were uh, made captive by the Native Americans is significantly larger amounts were uh, sold into slavery by the English. Right. Um, e- even the uh, Prane Indians were confined interned, internment camped on Deer Island. Deer Island. Yeah, yeah, that was fucking nuts. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of a McCarthyist campaign, right? Yeah, but, I mean, and like racial paranoia. Like, it's 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 all there uh, <laughs> back yeah. then. And um, the, the, it really he- heated up during the Pequot War. I mean, the Pequots got basically genocided. The Pequots that show up in King Philip's War on the side of the English. Um, and yeah, like that, that's the, there's, and Julipur, uh, she sort of distinguishes between captives, servants, and slaves. And there's captives who, you know, obviously captured servants who have to perform labor, Slaves is when that is transferred, can be transferred onto your children. You're basically right, no yeah, compensation inherited. and also absolutely zero compensation. Servants can be compensated a bit more. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, and another thing to mention is there's no evidence of like uh, sexual assault by uh, the Native Americans mm-hmm. and captives. And Mary Rollinson a couple times says like, oh, and I wasn't even hurt or I was surprised yeah. I got through this. My chastity was intact. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but we will play a little bit of, um, of uh, I want to play the first seven minutes of the open just so people get a feel of what it's like. Um, and what you, you get a sense of like the Native Americans, they were winning this conflict oh um, yeah if this is a psychological campaign this opening like uh seven minutes or a couple of paragraphs is just like fuck <laughs> okay, yeah i quit and like a few different things that have changed from king uh, from the pequot war is um you know at that time there was still the uh embargo against selling native americans guns Mm. This time they have guns and they're better at using them than the colonists because colonists farm and the Native Americans hunt. Um, So there's these things and all these stories of like 
you know, you hear something uh, like a rock hit the window and you look out and you're just done. Yeah. And, uh, like pretty, pretty crazy stuff. So we'll, we'll go hear, uh, this opening of the first bestseller in American history. Yeah. The Da Vinci code of its time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Another funny thing is the guy who reads this is from Moorhead, Minnesota. I saw that at the end. I was wondering if you guys knew each other. And I, I do not know who this guy is. Not yet. Part one of the narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson by Mary Rowlandson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matthew Scott Superna. The Sovereignty and Goodness of God together with the faithfulness of his promises displayed, being a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, commended by her to all that desires to know the Lord's doings to and dealings with her, especially to her dear children and relations. The second edition, corrected and amended, written by her own hand for her private use, and now made public at the earnest desire of some friends and for the benefit of the afflicted. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any can deliver out of my hand. On the 10th of February, 1675, came the Indians with great numbers upon Lancaster. Their first coming was about sunrising. Hearing the noise of some guns, we looked out. Several houses were burning, and the smoke ascending to heaven. There were five persons taken in one house, the father and the mother and a sucking child. They knocked on the head. The other two they took and carried away alive. There were two others, who, being out of their garrison upon some occasion, were set upon. One was knocked on the head, the other escaped. Another there was, who, running along, was shot and wounded, and fell down. He begged of them his life, promising them money, as they told me. But they would not hearken to hear him, but knocked him in the head, and stripped him naked, and split open his bowels. Another, seeing many of the Indians about his barn, ventured and went out was quickly shot down. There were three others belonging to the same garrison who were killed. The Indians, getting up upon the roof of the barn, had advantage to shoot down upon them over their fortification. Thus these murderous wretches went on, burning and destroying before them. At length they came and beset our own house, and quickly it was the dolefulest day that ever mine eyes saw. The house stood upon the edge of a hill. Some of the Indians got behind the hill others into the barn, and others behind anything that could shelter them. From all which places they shot against the house, so that the bullets seemed to fly like hail. And quickly they wounded one man among us, then another, and then a third. About two hours, according to my observation in that amazing time, they had been about the house before they prevailed to fire it, which they did with flax and hemp, which they brought out of the barn, and there being no defense about the house, only two flankers at two opposite corners, and one of them not finished. They fired it once, and ventured out, and quenched it. But they quickly fired it again, and that took. Now is the dreadful hour come, that I have often heard of. In time of war, as it was in the case of others, but now mine eyes see it. Some in our house were fighting for their lives, others wallowing in their blood. The house on fire over our heads, and the bloody heathen ready to knock us on the head if we stirred out. Now... Might we hear mothers and children crying out for themselves, and one another? Lord, what shall we do? Then I took my children, and one of my sisters, hers, to go forth and leave the house. But as soon as we came to the door and appeared, the Indians shot so thick that the bullets rattled against the house, as if one had taken a handful of stones and threw them, so that we were fain to give back. We had six stout dogs belonging to our garrison, but none of them would stir. Though another time, if any Indian had come to the door, they were ready to fly upon him and tear him down. The Lord, so much for man's best friend. <laughs> Dogs just standing, standing down. Just yeah, looking to yeah. It's a big, big blow for dog people everywhere that it, they're just standing on the sidelines. It's interesting they mention um, the, the 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 fire right. Like they set houses on fire. That's a big. Uh, part of this is yeah. destroying property. Um, I got a bit I want to quote from Jill Lepore here. I have to say as a, um, as a piece of literature, this does, this Mary does one of my favorite things, which is 
pardon me, cuts through all the table setting shit that so many novels and now like prestige TV does, where you can tell they do not want to talk about it, but they're like, how do we make this character sympathetic? And it's just, I want to like scream at the page that if someone is being like attacked, Mm -hmm. you don't have to make them sympathetic. That's a sympathetic scenario. And that for Mary to just start off within the opening lines being like, this is where we are. Like we're in this house. Guess what? This house is under attack. Like my, my relative is now like in the pool of their own blood. That's an opening. Like that's, that's an incredible literary conceit, I think. And I'm hooked. I'm hooked already. Yeah. Um, the town of Medfield, Massachusetts was burned. And there was a note left by possibly James Printer, who we'll, again, we'll meet here. I mean, actually, I'll, I'll just go into James Printer's um, biography. He was, like John Sassaman, he worked with, uh, as an interpreter for John Eliot for the uh, Eliot Indian Bible and actually typesetter. Mm. Uh, actually, there's a term, printer's devil. Um, and if you know how much you know, Native Americans are called devils. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's like he was not only a printer's devil, but yeah, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So he's a typesetter for 16 years before King Philip's War. Um, it's the Mark Twain of his time. I didn't know Twain was a typesetter. Oh yeah, interesting. Um, he escaped a mob accusing him of participating in raids uh, in Lancaster, which is the one that uh, took Mary Rowlandson uh, for King Philip. Uh, and he wrote a, and so this letter that le- was left in the town of uh, Medfield says, Thou Englishman hath provoked us to anger and wrath, and we care not though we have war with you this twenty-one years, for there are many of us, three hundred of which, hath fought with you at this town. We have nothing but our lives to lose, but thou hast many fair houses, cattle, and much good things. Um, now that that is a... Um, comparing like we just have our lives to lose yeah um you have these houses stuff like that's like um you think about how we look at um what's called like asymmetric terrorism yeah uh and like just a a person could hijack a plane and and our society is so complex that it it can there's much more the bigger they are the harder they fall sort of thing yeah and there's something there's there's a very powerful reversal in that that you know, we've we've talked about it in like uh, Scarlet Letter and other that the the need to recreate and Hope Leslie the need to recreate uh, England or whatever European country you, you came from in the New World and then for this person who's been there you know culturally a much longer time to be like actually you're not there this is just a reminder that this is not a complete mimesis and in reality can be all be taken away by you immediately and violently right in time of war as it was in the case of others but now mine eyes see it some in our house were fighting for their lives others wallowing in their blood the house on fire over our heads and the bloody heathen ready to knock us on the head if we stirred out now might we hear mothers and children crying out for themselves and one another lord what shall we do Then I took my children, and one of my sisters, hers, to go forth and leave the house. But as soon as we came to the door and appeared, the Indians shot so thick that the bullets rattled against the house, as if one had taken a handful of stones and threw them, so that we were fain to give back. We had six stout dogs belonging to our garrison, but none of them would stir, though another time, if any Indian had come to the door, they were ready to fly upon him and tear him down. The Lord hereby would make us the more acknowledge his hand, and to see that our help is always in him. But out we must go, the fire increasing and coming along behind us roaring, and the Indians gaping before us with their guns, spears, and hatchets to devour us. No sooner were we out of the house, but my brother-in-law, being before wounded in defending the house, in or near the throat, fell down dead, whereat the Indians scornfully shouted and hollowed and were presently upon him, stripping off his clothes, the bullets flying thick. One went through my side, and the same, as would seem, through the bowels and hand of my dear child in my arms. One of my elder sister's children, named William, had then his leg broken, which the Indians, perceiving, they knocked him on his head. Thus we were butchered by those merciless heathen, standing amazed, with the blood running down to our heels. My eldest sister, being yet in the house, and seeing those woeful sights, the infidels hauling mothers one way and children another. And so 
some wallowing in their blood, and her elder son telling her that her son William was dead, and myself was wounded, she said, And Lord, let me die with them, which was no sooner said, but she was struck with a bullet, and fell down dead over the threshold. I hope she is reaping the fruit of her good labors, being faithful to the service of God in her place. In her younger years she lay under much trouble upon spiritual accounts, till it pleased God to make that precious scripture take hold of her heart. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Second Corinthians 12, 9. Two More than twenty years after, <laughs> I have heard her tell how sweet and comfortable that place was to her. But to return, the Indians laid hold of us, pulling me one way and the children another, and said, Come, go along with us. I told them they would kill me. They answered, If I were willing to go along with them, they would not hurt me. Oh, the doleful sight that now is to behold at this house. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. Of thirty-seven persons who were in this one house, none escaped either present death or a bitter captivity, save only one who might say as he, and I only am escaped alone to tell the news. Job 1, 15. There were twelve killed, some shot, some stabbed with their spears, some knocked down with their hatchets, when we are in prosperity, oh, the little that we think of such dreadful sights, and to see our dear friends and relations lie bleeding out their heart blood upon the ground. There was one who was chopped into the head with a hatchet and stripped naked, and yet was crawling up and down. It is a solemn sight to see so many Christians lying in their blood, some here, some there, like a company of sheep torn by wolves, all of them stripped naked by a company of hellhounds, roaring, singing, ranting, and insulting as if they would have torn our very hearts out. Yet the Lord, by his almighty power, preserved a number of us from death, for there were twenty-four of us taken alive and carried captive. I had often before this said that if the Indians should come, I should choose rather to be killed by them than taken alive. But when it came to the trial, my mind changed. Their glittering weapons so daunted my spirit, that I chose rather to go along with those, as I may say, ravenous beasts, than that moment to end my days and that I may the better declare what happened to me during that grievous captivity, I shall particularly speak of the several removes we had up and down in the wilderness. I quite like that digression. I think that's what it... This, I think, to be honest about this piece, is first and foremost a piece of propaganda. Yeah. That doesn't mean that what's interesting as a piece of literature is that although it is propaganda, it is complex, and it does have a level of nuance to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, usually stamped out by the message right after. But right. I, I love mm. that conceit of her being like, yeah, I told people all the time, if like Native Americans come, like, uh, I'd rather they kill me. Mm. And then to see that face to face and for her to be like, ah, uh, never mind. That's such a human. She reaches across from the 17th century to me right now in Brooklyn and me being like, yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, but, but then bullshits her way through it being like, well, maybe if I stay alive, I can tell my story. There's no way she had that thought the, in that moment. Um, the problem you would have though is as Jill Lepore writes, it's very gendered what the expectations are for captives. Oh, right. So we would be expected to fight and save ourselves or like take a few Indians with us. Yeah. I would defect uh, so quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, hell yeah. You got, you got uh, tobacco in here, King Philip? I mean, like, if they killed like 20 people, I'd be like, well, you're obviously much more powerful. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I don't know. What what do you need? Where do I go to learn about the great spirit? Let's, yeah, let's get like, after this. What kind of video editing uh, do you need? The the, the section where she, she describes the gore and like the people lying around... Um, um, yeah, there was one who was chopped into the head with a hatchet and stripped naked and yet was crawling up and down. It is a solemn sight to see so many Christians lying in their blood. Some of hellhound. He said of their heart blood. That's nasty. Which like is it's, nasty. Like it's coming out in spurts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, some of the hellhounds roaring, singing, ranting, and insulting as if they would have torn the very hearts out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that image of... I yeah, hear some there, like a company of sheep torn by wolves. Yes. There's that, and I love that one, and the one where it's like some, some woman was praying for God to take her life, and then she died. Mm -hmm. She was shot. That those two images are put right next to each other, assuming one correlates to the other, but the, the very, like, very matter-of-fact way that she's relating this information is if those events have nothing to do with each other. That's actually just random violence, and she just happened to say that, and it's like, what a disgusting thing to see. 
almost that someone's like praying to end their life and they get it, but that's not really what happened. She was just massacred randomly like everyone else. Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but I think it was in Jill Lepore's book about this guy who sat in the uh, town square reading his Bible during the Indian attack, <laughs> convinced that that was going to save him, uh. and it turned out that he was the only casualty. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> so, uh, I don't know what we can learn from that. Um, let's move on uh, a little bit more. This is to... I think this is, is this one of your uh, time codes. I think. Oh, yeah, the burying of the child. Mm. Again, my child being even ready to depart the sorrowful world, they bade me carry it out to another wigwam, I suppose because they would not be troubled with such spectacles. This is uh, the child that was shot along with Mary Rowlandson. It was, she said the sh- shot went through her bowels in her hand, and this baby is finally a week later dying. It's remarkable that she lived. Yeah, pretty A much. gut wound? Yeah, it must have not passed through anything. Yeah. Or just a very strong baby. She's made it up. Whither I went out with a very heavy heart, and down I sat with a picture of death in my lap. About two hours in the night, my sweet babe, like a lamb, departed this life on February 18th, 1675. It being about six years and five months old, it was nine days from the first wounding. In this miserable condition, without any refreshing of one nature or other, except a little cold water, I cannot but take notice how at another time I could not bear to be in the room where any dead person was, but now the case is changed. I must and could lie down with my dead babe, side by side, all the night after. I have thought since of the wonderful goodness of God to me in preserving me in the use of my reason and senses in that distressed time that I did not use wicked and violent means to end my own miserable life. Hmm. In the morning, when they understood that my child was dead, they sent for me to my master's wigwam. By my master, in this writing, must be under. She uh, has a number of masters over the course of her captivity. She get, basically gets bartered for different goods, um, and different uh, Indians basically have sort of, I guess, patriarchal authority over her. Yeah. ...to end my own miserable life. In the morning... When they understood that my child was dead, they sent for me to my master's wigwam. By my master, in this writing must be understood Quinnipin, who was a sagamore, and married King Philip's wife's sister. Not that he first took me, but I was sold to him by another Narragansett Indian, who took me when first I came out of the garrison. I went to take up my dead child in my arms to carry it with me, but they bid me let it alone. There was no resisting, but go I must and leave it. When I had been at my master's wigwam, I took the first opportunity I could to go look after my dead child. When I came, I asked them what they had done with it, and they told me it was upon the hill. Then they went and showed me where it was, for I saw the ground was newly digged, and there they told me they had buried it. There I left that child in the wilderness, and must commit it, and myself in this wilderness condition to him who is above all. God having taken away this dear child, I went to see my daughter Mary. Who was at this same Indian town at a wigwam not very far off. So I'm curious to see what you two think about that passage because there's a lot going on there um, in the literary sense that she fluctuates in between referring to her own child as her child and it. Mm. And my first impulse is that she's become so degraded by this um, war atmosphere that she's losing the understanding of humanity and taking on what she would attribute to like native american uh way of looking at things which yeah. is like the the nothingness of or like a, a more like nihilistic yes kind thank of. you a nihilistic way i'm just curious what you two had thought of that passage because it's very curious well and she already is uh it she already uh mentions the the it looked like sheep torn by wolves yeah. right and i do think there's a lot of that sort of she she is in a sort of weird fallen status where she's and she gets increasingly consumed by uh, like hunger and thirst and yes, that sort of thing exactly yeah. that was something that i was thinking about through all like the whole text mm-hmm. um basically that there is a transformation of of mary from a uh, kind of god-fearing christian puritan to 
something much more fleshly, much more embodied and corporeal and um, visceral. In the, and you see this transformation happen in her language. And I think mm -hmm. this is a great example of that, Alex, where she, in some ways, it feels like she's, she sees her child, her dead child, as a piece of meat. You know? oh, okay. And like, there's so much meat in this text, like yeah. all of the stuff that the Indians give her to eat, you know, she's initially disgusted by until she gets hungry enough to eat it. Yeah. And it just feels like all of these bodily experiences, um, eating and sleeping, all of these functions are like tainted by the initial experience of violence in the first few pages. So, uh, after that experience, like everything is kind of a murdered piece of meat. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, I actually have a bit. This is uh, from later in the story here. Um, I think it's from the fifth remove where she's talking about taste. Over the river that night, but it was the night after the Sabbath before all the company was got over. On the Saturday they boiled an old horse's leg which they had got, and so we drank of the broth as soon as they thought it was ready, and when it was almost all gone they filled it up again. The first week of my being among them I hardly ate anything. The second week I found my stomach grow very faint for want of something, and yet it was very hard to get down their filthy trash. The third week, <laughs> though I could not think how formerly like my stomach asshole. would turn against this or that, and I could starve and die before I could eat such things, yet they were sweet and savory to my taste. I was at this time knitting a pair of white cotton stockings for my mistress, and had not yet wrought upon a Sabbath day. When the Sabbath came, they bade me go to work. I told them it was the Sabbath day, and desired them to let me rest, and told them I would do as much more tomorrow. To which they answered me they would break my face. And he Good God. <laughs> that reading. <laughs> to which they told me they would break my face. There's two little things that sound so remarkably um, modern. Like the which the I mean filthy you wouldn't say but their yeah. food is trash uh -huh. yeah and break my face <laughs> and it makes me think of like maybe there's this underlying current of like qu um, colloquial English hmm. that's basically like existed for centuries and Mary mm. Rowlandson she's not like a yeah I don't think she's writer. like a highly educated woman uh, I, I actually I, to be honest I haven't looked too deeply into her background um, uh, the notes I have. I mean, it's it's so clear that she has the writer's sense. She yes. she mm. nails detail in a way that, like, honestly, other writers that we've talked about in this podcast have weren't able to grasp. And her sense of timing is great too. Yes. I think. Yeah, like her spacing, whatever spacing of information. I don't know where you could learn that if you weren't extremely well read. She's just, she's just a natural. Well, I think if you think about sermons, stuff yeah. that she was consuming in yeah. her daily life, like. It starts to make a bit more sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm that's thinking true. especially of that moment in the early part of the the text where she says something like, "And now I came to this realization," and she really clearly like signposts and indicates that she's like escalating the narrative yeah. tension, and that is mm -hmm. a, a great device, I think, and it works really, really well. Yeah, there's absolutely like a sense of a passion play about it. Mm, yes, in movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, let's move to where they cross the river to go visit King Philip. This is my... Um, are we going to come back to food? Uh, no, this, if you, we got more to say on food? Yeah, I I mean, I just think the food in this text is fascinating. Um, I also think that we could probably market, like, Mary Rowlandson's Wilderness Cookbook to <laughs> Brooklyn hipsters in 2019. Yeah, probably. I mean, she's basically living on bone broth. It's very paleolithic, yeah, her diet. Yeah. I that think. image of the bone, is it the deer bone in boiling water that boils to the level where the maggots seep out of the bone? No, the seep out of yeah. the marrow. Yeah, yeah. Well, Striking. Well, and there's boiled horse's feet. Oh, that's what it is, it's yeah. It's like it's jello. collagen. Very good for well, you. She, she talks about how she's amazed because she she's perceptive enough. No, she, I mean, she's very, I mean, I guess this wouldn't be foreign policy. This is just war policy. But she's aware that the um, colonists had attacked uh, like corn storage and you know foodstuffs for the Native Americans, mm -hmm. and she's commenting on even though we did that, I haven't seen a single hungry uh, in in this entire time I've been captive. That is Which true. Which actually doesn't fit with some of the historical sources we read. Right? Apparently, there was a lot of starvation 
around this time? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's it's. I think it's just that the Native Americans were able to make do. Yeah. Like they they. I think she does mention uh, one of them going to get like corn that they had stored in a certain area that and she came back with like a bag and a half of it yeah. um mm-hmm. so they made provision but and they're just very resourceful um by doing that thing like boiling the maggots out of you know old horse flesh basically and um and using bear grease to make a cake out of ground nuts yeah and, and um and actually it was more the 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 more um the pequot wars was more heavily based on the um i think the resource crunch like they were running out there was a hurricane uh, in in 1635 that really hurt them so i think by by the time 1675 is around i think um like i mean if people were still hungry the property uh values wouldn't be rising so much in the 1660s mm-hmm. basically um but i uh, anyway i i think get yeah, to, to piggyback off of the corporeal nature of what she's talking about especially with food that there's something verboten in in her relishing in like the detail of everyday life. Oh, definitely. That happens in 2019 to work really well for her. Like the idea of describing your surroundings accurately and acutely and very like very very specifically. Like that mm. that's the nature of good writing. Well, quantifiably mm. too. Yeah. She's very uh, she mentions actually I think it's right before I think. I don't think it's included in the clip I'm about to play. But she the uh the Wampanoags, the Indians, are preparing to cross a river, and she's trying to count all of them. But she's like, I can't. There's just too many of them. But in other cases, you know, she she lists the amount of casualties. She, mm-hmm. She's very um, specific about that sort of thing. It's almost like this scenario has given her license to revel in things that she has been raised not to revel in, which is like the the fundament of the earth, like the everyday nasty dirty dingy things like she's supposed to be focused on the progress of the soul towards redemption very like non-physical things and now that she's the physical world's been forced on her she's going to be mm-hmm. like well like now that well while we're here basically i think it's also a, a function of her trauma yes mm-hmm. that it, with traumatic experiences like one remembers certain details yeah. and other things one just forgets yeah it does have the air of just something like seared into her yeah I mean, she spent the, a night previous just laying with her dead baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. That was quite beautiful. Talking about how she would always want to leave the room when there was a dead body present, and now she finds herself holding her dead child. Is yeah. the child ever gendered? I think it is a girl. And six years old, I think is what she. Yeah, that's what she said. That seems old for to call it a baby, but. Mm. So I mean, maybe not. I don't know. It's first grade, isn't that kindergarten? First yeah, grade. Yeah, like first grade. Um, come on, kid. Yeah, I wouldn't. I was not held at that age, even if I was shot. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, it was uh, baby Sarah. Mm. And it's interesting. The other thing is how she. She, her kids are separated from her. The, the Native Americans do atomize it, um, the family. So the kids are held in different areas and things like that. But she's able to like go and visit them. And yeah, and, uh, it's all exchange. It's, yeah, you got to give some. And there's a marketplace there, yeah. which is very there's an something you wouldn't expect. Yeah, and they slot her right into doing that. And actually, we'll get a get a bit of that here. Uh, this is where she finally meets King Philip himself, the man of the hour. <laughs> dress but to return we travel on until night and in the morning we must go over the river to philip's crew when i was in the canoe i could not but be amazed at the numerous crew of pagans that were on the boat on the other side when i came ashore they gathered all about me i sitting alone in the midst i observed they asked one another questions and laughed and rejoiced over their gains and victories then my heart began to fail and i fell a-weeping which was the first time to my remembrance that I wept before them, although I had met with so much affliction and my heart was many times ready to break, yet could I not shed one tear in their sight, but rather had been all this while in amaze and like one astonished. But now I may say, as Psalm 137, 1, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, 
and there one of them asked me why I wept. I could hardly tell what to say, yet I answered, they would kill me. No, he said, none will hurt you. Then came one of them and gave me two spoonfuls of meal to comfort me, and another gave me there's a lovely dramatic irony in her quoting that psalm, which is the psalm of the Israelites after they had been uh, ejected from Israel by the Babyl- uh, Babylonians. Mm-hmm. And they're singing this song like, this is our homeland, like this is what we, we always were here and now we're no longer here. And the idea that she's like, we, we were always here in colonial America and like it's, yeah. it's so fucked up that we were thrown out by these Indians. Who, yeah, okay. But then to, to, she's right. She doesn't even know how right she is because, yes, the like Israelites did displace the, um, oh, God damn it. Grace, help me. You're on your own here. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. The, I cannot, we've got it. I've got to get this and then you can edit all this yeah, out. Fine. The, um, no. You Google? Um, no. The Israelites just placed another group in the Israeli area to take that territory. So she's right. She doesn't know how right she is. That's mm-hmm. like, this is our home. It's always been our home, is what the colonizer always says. Right. They would kill me. No, he said. None will hurt you. Then came one of them and gave me two spoonfuls of meal to comfort me, and another gave me half a pint of peas, which was more worth than many bushels at another time. Then I went to see King Philip. He bade me come in and sit down, and asked me whether I would smoke it, a usual compliment nowadays among saints and sinners. But this no way suited me, for though I had formerly used tobacco, yet I had left it ever since I was first taken. It seems to be a bait the devil lays to make men lose their precious time. I remember with shame formerly, when I had taken two or three pipes, it was presently ready for another. Such a bewitching <laughs> thing it is. But I thank God he has now given me power over it. Surely there are many who may be better employed than to lie sucking a stinking tobacco pipe. Now, That's another one of those modern touches, to sucking a stinking tobacco pipe. She has, got, she's a, she has a Whitman-esque turn of phrase. Yeah. Hmm. It's a, a real shame that she her claim to fame is being captured and surviving when she completely could have had the chance to uh, be a great writer, I think. I mean, she survived for a while. She just never... It's not that impressive. But. She, could, she had a very difficult second album yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, the sophomore slump, yeah, as the they sophomore call it. Slump. I wonder if, uh, if King Philip is putting it, something else in those tobacco pipes. But it is very interesting to me that... I mean, it is uh, the... I don't know, like that tobacco and and sort of how intrinsic that is to America. There's another point where um, she's given tobacco by some liaisons uh, uh, connected with the colonists as they're trying to negotiate her uh, return. And she gives it away right away because she doesn't like it herself. And then she, yeah. she sells she it. Sells she it. sells it right. Yeah, sorry. And uh, and then another an American comes and says, "Hey, can you give me some of that?" And she's like, "It's gone." And he gets pissed because it's like you're supposed to be a receptacle for mm-hmm. resources we can you know get from colonists. Yeah, her uh, her reserve about the tobacco plant is like the through line for one of like her fastidious ways of surviving in this scenario. That she's not addicted to this substance, so she's able to like use it to her advantage to gain like money or influence and things like that. That's a very interesting kind of B plot that goes throughout this. It's like in prison. Like yeah. right? you don't smoke your cigarettes, you can sell them. Yeah, and she's like setting up the New England disdain for the tobacco and the South and their obsession with it. Right. When I had taken two or three pipes, it was presently ready for another. Such a bewitching thing it is. But I thank God he has now given me power over it. Surely there are many who may be better employed than to lie sucking a stinking tobacco pipe. Now the Indians gather their forces to go against Northampton. Overnight, one went yelling and hooting to give notice of the design, whereupon they fell to boiling of ground nuts, and parching of corn, as many had it, for their provision, and in the morning away they went. During my abode in this place, Philip spake to me to make a shirt for his boy, which I did, for which he gave me a shilling. I offered the money to my master, but he bade me keep it, and with it I bought a piece of horse flesh. Afterwards he asked me to make a cap for his boy, for which he invited me to dinner. 
I went, and he gave me a pancake, about as big as two fingers. It was made of parched wheat, beaten and fried in bear's grease, but I thought I never tasted pleasanter meat in my life. There was a squaw who spake to me to make a shirt for her sun-up, for which she gave me a piece of bear. Another asked me to knit a pair of stockings, for which she gave me a quart of peas. I boiled my peas and bear together and invited my master and mistress to dinner. But the proud gossip, because I served them both in one dish, would eat nothing, except one bit that he gave her upon the point of his knife. Here he Hot weird. one. Yeah. So she, put, she gives the husband and wife food in the same dish, and they snub her for it? Yeah. I mean, this is so also... Bizarre. in Hope God, Le- the English are the worst. <laughs> well, in Hope Leslie, there's also that point where the Native Americans are coming to eat with the Winthrops. and oh, That's true. Yes. And the seating uh, uh, is not correct. And, and they take a stand. Yeah. Which uh, reminds me of, like, di- you know, like, different cultures. Like, China, I feel like. I've, I've seen, like, great courses about different sort of cultural awareness things, like classes. Like, you need to do this. and uh, Like, saving face. Yeah. And and when you apply that to like a a culture that's distinct from your own, it seems sort of like weird, but then you realize like we have our own different like saving face sort of like things that are probably confusing to other people. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um I think mealtime probably has the most ceremony around it that goes un that goes un yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, is it the the critic in the room. Uh yeah, I feel like mealtime has probably the most like unrecognized ceremony for any person that's like indigenous to the culture that you don't recognize how many like uh, social checks you're making all the time that mm. you don't even notice. And some are unspoken and implicit. Yeah. It, it's but all- I feel like America has the least ritual around eating of any country I've <laughs> ever traveled in. Just because you've seen in. me eat with my hand before and like the other arm is guarding the plate. Being like, ah! Oh, like the sort of shoveling with a fork as opposed to <laughs> using a knife and fork. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Oh, but yeah. I the, the way that it's just laid out in a trough. <laughs> <laughs> I eat Chipotle burrito bowls with two forks. <laughs> <laughs> just the double wide. <laughs> That's my ritual. Oh, my but it, I also like this section because it, it highlights how she's immediately integrated into their economy yeah yeah like start sewing stuff Mm -hmm. and uh we we will literally we'll trade with you on you know fair grounds Uh, yeah that is speaking if looking at it through the lens of propaganda that's such a perfect (laughs) image of like like look what women's work can do can actually save you in a scenario where you are captive because she she has two things at her advantage one she doesn't seem to be into tobacco so she can barter that for other goods and two she has a skill which is Mm. to knit essentially and like that that is some sort of uh uh amazing quality to be when you're in the when you're in the uh captivity of native americans because they seem to not be able to have that Mm-hmm. So every, I mean, literally, people are lining up asking for asking for her services. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there's one. Uh, uh, it's interesting. Um, th- uh, before I get into this, there's one woman who comes up and like asks her for a piece of her apron. I believe it yep. is, mm-hmm. and she's like, "I'm not gonna give you a piece of my apron." And she's like, "Well, I'm gonna they kill you or something, <laughs> yeah, um, knock or knock you on, you on the, the head. head," which I think means scalping. <laughs> oh, um, really? Basically, yeah. Oh. Uh, which piece Good do euphemism. you want? Yep. Yeah. And uh, and she's like, well, just take it then. <laughs> you just have the whole thing. It's like yeah. a Solomon's, uh, King cut Solomon's the baby, baby sort of thing. You don't cut the apron in half. It's interesting that I think um, there is a tension, though, because while she does do a lot of, uh, she participates a lot in their kind of exchange economy, mm-hmm. she is also the recipient of a certain amount of charity from them. Like there are examples in the text of her being just given things out mm-hmm. of, and it's implied that it's out of kindness, but because all of this is filtered through her theology, um, the Indians are completely denied agency, and those instances of charity right. are described as acts of God. Yeah, so it's yeah. God working through the Indians, so they don't get any credit for that. Right. Well, e- yeah, even if, yeah, I've noticed that, and also, like, if they do any good thing, it's it's still a random act. Like, all acts Arbitrary. from these Native Americans yeah, yep. are random. It might, it'd be like if the tree were to give you shade is not an act of kindness. It's just yeah. an act of the happenstance of being there. Yeah. Like, she talks about how, there's multiple passages where she talks about how, like, I did this and I wasn't expecting this response. Like basically yeah. that, not that she couldn't, it wasn't a, uh, a cultural literacy problem so much as these people don't have reason. 
Yeah. Like you might as well be like you're happen to be captured by wolves who are biped essentially. And it kind of comes full circle at the end of the text where she kind of ties all her loose ends together and starts to moralize more explicitly about her experience. Um, I think she talks about how uh, she's amazed that God basically sustains the Indians with their various like dietary practices, like all the ways that they are basically managing to stay alive. She's like, and that's God keeping them alive so they can be a scourge to us yes so that they can be god's instrument right. in teaching us a lesson yeah about how sinful we are and yeah it's so such complete lack of agency on both sides like evil and good yeah, yeah. here's here's the uh, part where she's given a bible um uh, I cannot but take notice of the wonderful mercy of God to me in those afflictions in sending me a Bible. One of the Indians that came from Medfield uh, from Medfield fight had brought me some plunder, came to me and asked me if I would have a Bible. He had got one in his basket. Now, is that not a big risk for that Indian? Like, well, specifically, there were there's description of um, of of soldiers on the trail coming across the area where there's just bibles ripped and scorn and the pages just scattered around the like grass and like they, they come and because they specifically hated this john elliott bible and how mm. it was trying to mm-hmm. like convert people away from their culture basically and so they were they explicitly didn't like bibles they, they knew exactly what they were they knew what they were doing it's and psychological warfare exactly and so to yeah to give her one that's yeah. it's pretty amazing actually and that's the thing is i, I want to play this i'll play this little clip here then i'll the, it, it, there's no general um you know you talk about like propaganda there's no general when when you talk about um when she talks about native americans in this story there's like a sort of like feeling that this should this indian i'm describing now the behavior should stand in for the entire race yes. right mm-hmm. yeah but there's their behavior is so varied yeah that it's just clear like oh actually wampanoags are just human beings also with different personalities and you know different codes of conduct <laughs> she describes them as very capricious as well yeah and like yeah. very mercurial like uh, one minute they're telling her the truth the next minute they're lying telling barefaced lies to her and then there's a sort of arbitrariness to the way that she experiences their power over her uh, yeah uh here i'll you want uh, yeah, I feel like she conflates the idea of understanding God's mission and uh, reason as the same thing. That these Native Americans are unable to grasp reason because mm. they don't have the same background as her. I, I always she brings up reason more than once, and yeah, I, it's always in the same breath as God's will or God's grace, essentially. Mm. Which is Logos. about it's about the right time because this is right, like burgeoning the. Uh, age of reason or whatever like the mm-hmm. enlightenment, enlightenment where they take they make that pivot and the pivot from like we're a christian nation to like well we're a reasonable nation and that that pivot is because of all these interactions with people who have no need for christendom they have to, mm-hmm. well we need something else <laughs> to buttress our, our opinions from uh, these people uh, here is from the uh, ninth remove where she's given leave to go visit her uh, son Held in the Nagaranset country, my son being now about a mile from me, I asked Liberty to go and see him. They bade me go, and away I went, but quickly lost myself traveling over hills and through swamps, and could not find the way to him, and I cannot but admire the wonderful power and goodness of God to me, in that, though I was gone from home, and met with all sorts of Indians, and those I had no knowledge of, and there being no Christian soul near me, yet not one of them offered the least imaginable miscarriage to me. I turned homeward again and met with my master. He showed me the way to my son. So yeah, that that reminds me of like, especially conservatives who spent their entire life in like smaller towns or like that don't like oh get i walked, em. get I, a mat you walked through <laughs> you walked through uh brooklyn new york at 11 p.m yeah and and weren't afraid about getting knifed it's it's not that so much as it's like if you ever read like articles about like look what williamsburg's up to now 
And then like, you know, it's like they have a, a $10 coffee. And then there's like a comment from someone in like Ohio being like, that is, fu- that is ridiculous. Like what, what the hell is Brooklyn going to do next? And it's like, why do you give a shit? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we'll go to this, this, uh, final part, um, where, uh, a Mr. Whore, H O A R. Uh, comes and he's trying to negotiate the uh, release of Mary Rowlandson. It was a great mistake in any. Who thought I sent for tobacco? For through the favor of God, that desire was overcome. I now asked them whether I should go home with Mr. Hoare. They answered no. One and another of them, and it being night, we laid down with that answer. In the morning, Mr. Hoare invited the Sagamores to dinner, but when we went to get it ready, we found that they had stolen the greatest part of the provision Mr. Hoare had brought out of his bags in the night. And we may see the wonderful power of God in that one passage, in that when there was such a great number of the Indians together, and so greedy of a little good food, and no English there but Mr. Hoare and myself, that they did not knock us in the head, and take what we had, there being not only some provision, but also trading cloth, a part of the 20 pounds agreed upon, but in st- Trading cloth is very interesting. That's like paper currency, basically. Yeah. Instead of doing us any mischief, they seemed to be ashamed of the fact, and said, they were the same matchet Indian that did it. Oh, that we could believe that there is nothing too hard for God. God showed his power over the heathen in this, as he did over the hungry lions when Daniel was cast into the den. Mr. Hoare called them be time to dinner. But they ate very little, they being so busy in dressing themselves and getting ready for their dance, which was carried on by eight of them, four men and four squaws. My master and mistress being two, he was dressed in his holland shirt, with great laces sewed at the tail of it. He had his silver buttons, his white stockings, his garters were hung round with shillings, and he had girdles of wampum upon his head and shoulders. She had a kirsey coat, and covered with girdles of wampum from the loins upward. Her arms from her elbows to her hands were covered with bracelets. There were handfuls of necklaces about her neck, and several sorts of jewels in her ears. She had fine red stockings and white shoes, her hair powdered and face painted red. That was always before black, and all the dancers were after the same manner. There were two others singing and knocking on a kettle for their music. They kept hopping up and down, one after another, with a kettle of water in the midst, standing warm upon some embers to drink of when they were dry. They held on till it was almost night, throwing out wampum to the standers by. At night I asked them again if I should go home. They all as one said no, except my husband would come for me. When we were lain down, my master went out of the wigwam, and by and by sent in an Indian called James the Printer, who told Mr. Hoare that my master would let me go home tomorrow, if he would let him have one pint of liquors. James Printer, the guy who's been working as a translator for King Philip, and eventually he would, um, about a month or so after uh, Mary Rowlandson returns, he'd also return to uh, you know Boston. Um, and he'd actually go back to being a printer. He'd actually print Mary Rowlandson's, this narrative. He'd typeset the very first one, uh, r- r- reportedly. But in order for him to come back into the fold, he had to provide, uh, I think, f- a couple or maybe five scalps of uh, Native Americans. So, yeah. James James the Printer, or James Printer, as he became known. Which is, like, interesting to actually see you know, like, uh, uh, occupation name uh, come into existence. If he would let him have one pint of liquors. Then Mr. Horror uh, called his own Indians to me if I should to drink of when they were dry. They held on till it was almost night, throwing out wampum to the standers by. At night I asked them again if I should go home. They all as one said no, except my husband would come for me. When we were lain down, my master went out of the wigwam, and by and by sent in an Indian called James the Printer, who told Mr. Hoare that my master would let me go home tomorrow, if he would let him have one pint of liquors. Then Mr. Hoare called his own Indians, Tom and Peter, and bid them to go and see whether he would promise it before them three, and if he would, he should have it, which he did, and he had it. Then Philip, smelling the business, called me to him. 
and asked me what I would give him to tell me some good news, and speak of a good word for me. I told him, What will you give me to tell you some good news? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I like that play. So I got some good news, but I'm, I might just not tell you it. Yeah, it's it's such a it's a great encapsulation of what frontier colonial life would be, where there is no law. It's just what do you have, mm -hmm. and like what do you have to give me at this exact moment? That's the only thing that matters. Like there are no rules or like set laws. It's Norms, just yeah. yeah, it's like it's Hobbesian. Well, and like the, mm -hmm. it's also like the idea that good news can only be good news if it's spoken or like yeah. relayed like i can this this good news could not actually mean anything i yeah. just let it die yeah it's like her i feel like her analysis of the native americans as capricious is it should be expanded to the very existence that they're all living in which right. their existence mm. is capricious it well, the treaty change. the treaty is there exactly are yeah. Capricious. yeah yeah no no one group is activating a sense of capriciousness they're all reacting to a world that uh, fortunes change with any given day. Then Philip, smelling the business, called me to him, and asked me what I would give him to tell me some good news, and speak of a good word for me. I told him I could not tell what to give him. I would give him anything I had, and asked him what he would have. He said two coasts and twenty shillings in money, and half a bushel of seed corn, and some tobacco. I thanked him for his love, but I knew the good news as well as the crafty fox. <laughs> My master, after he had had his drink, quickly came ranting into the wigwam again and called for Mr. Hoare, drinking to him and saying he was a good man, and then he would say, hang him rogue. Being almost drunk, he would drink to him, and yet presently say he should be hanged. Then he called for me. I trembled to hear him, yet I was fain to go to him, and he drank to me, showing no incivility. He was the first Indian I saw drunk all the while that I was amongst them. At last his squaw ran out and he after her, round the wigwam, with his money jingling at his knees. But she escaped him. But having an old squaw, he ran to her, and so through the Lord's mercy. We were no more troubled that night, yet I had not a comfortable night's rest, for I think I can say I did not sleep for three nights together. The night before, the letter came from the consul. I could not rest. I was so full of fears and troubles, God many times leaving us most in the dark. When deliverance... Okay, yeah. Um... So yeah, the uh, her master really likes alcohol, and, but yeah. it's interesting that she mentions like this is the first one that I saw. Yeah, she hints at that there's some broader stereotype. Yeah, which is very, like that's to do that in 1682 is very interesting to me. Yeah, uh, so, but I mean because that does actually come up in in it, it plays some significance in actual conflicts. Um, like the the colonists did like to get Native Americans drunk and mm -hmm. have certain representatives um, sign papers, for instance. And uh, it's interesting because this is called King Philip's War, Metacomet's Rebellion. But actually, he wasn't like that's not really how the sachem ship worked. It was more distributed than that. There's different tribes. Um, there's a whole bunch of different sachems. Mm -hmm. King Philip was obviously just like and and he was known at, it, concurrently during the conflict as sort of one of the main the main guys uh, to the point where when he was killed that was sort of the end of the war but it's also the case that you know it's not just him mm -hmm. um but uh yeah i think uh that's about it for the clips today do you guys have anything uh final to uh observe i, I would say like one one more topic for a larger discussion that this is probably one of the best examples that we've come across about of uh, how the Puritan world exists. And we didn't play a lot in the clips, but every experience that she has, she's she's funneling through her rote memorization of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so much so that she, I think there was, there was one passage that uh, struck me where she said she didn't even know the full power of some specific lines of scripture until she had this like moment of destruction. Right. So it's like the, at this moment, uh, kind of get, like give like social context. So like one of the, the main linchpins for the reformation was the idea that the layman should be able to read the scriptures and to know the scriptures quite well. And it was this very like humanist vision mm -hmm. that like the plowman can recite the Psalms as, as he works or the, the weaver can um, know like the gospel as they, as they work. And 
in an unmediated way. Exactly. And the in unfortunately the inverse happens where it's like actually it's the only book they know and uh they neglect all others. That's like that's the Puritan uh uh mission essentially. So this this woman knows it's the only way she can really uh understand reality is through these very specific books that are collected in the bible yeah. and specifically the henry the henry james the king james <laughs> translation <on>. yeah <laughs> the king james <laughs> translation of those scriptures and but you can also it's so you can it, it, to a modern reader it can feel foolish when you first read it being like you have to be you should be able to experience this without the mediation of like job or something but you can also see the power in that culture she can experience something so traumatic as a 30 day captivity with a, an alien culture. And it not only does it not weaken her resolve, but it's actually something that's used to power her resolve. That it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, we've built in this experience in our world to buttress you and to make you even more powerful of a, a shock troop for our ideology. Right. And I think about that today with like, you know, the, there's certain ruptures happening in like our culture and like, and I wonder how flabby people who represent capitalism might be today that they're not ready for this kind of thing in the way that like puritans had the puritan cause had like had made itself a very powerful viable institution because of this nonstop war yeah and i feel like today that ideology like ideology isn't isn't battle tested in the way that those are from a couple hundred well i feel like it just gets sillier and less more abstract. Like the, uh, if you look at like Indian racial paranoia, where even the um, praying Indians are sent to Deer Island, mm-hmm. um, and then the sort of degeneration of this, because captivity narratives sort of became uh, were, were prominent in the uh, witch hunt times too. You're sort of captive, but to demons and i feel like that's the where capitalist defenders are now yeah like they have no idea what the real problem is or what the who the real enemies are yeah um they're starting to get afraid of socialism now yeah um but uh i think the the context of it is today you know you heard i heard what's his name uh gorka yeah gorka do like you know the green new deal is a watermelon it's uh green on the outside and red on the on the inside and it's like you read this and it's like that's not enough but it's 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 a bad sign for them that they have to explicitly be anti-socialist uh, yeah but it's we it's like it's it's flabby yeah. compared to this i guess um i also wanted to uh, speaking of the scriptures this is um when uh mary is left behind by her current master and she said i um I thought of being sold to my husband as my master spake, but instead of that, my master himself was gone. This is in the 13th remove. Mm. Uh, And I left behind so that my spirit was now quite ready to sink. I asked them to let me go out and pick some sticks that I might get alone and pour out my heart unto the Lord. Uh, Then also I took my Bible to read, but I found no comfort here neither, which many times I was wont to find. So easy a thing it is with God to dry up the streams of scripture to dry up the screams of scripture uh, comfort from us, which I thought was like, uh, that's like, but you, but you reference the Bible every paragraph. Like, yeah. <laughs> but it's built in there. It's like, yeah. even when it's not working, it's working. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's good. Like you can see, you know, it's like, we, you stretch it all the way to uh, Hawthorne's, um, um, uh, shit what's the last book that we did of his not wakefield house of seven gables yeah you stretch it all the way it's like it's this uh, ideology is exhausted by 1850 it's like like yeah it had a pretty good run though 200 years basically Mm -hmm. in the and like the violent wilderness and like this is to me like you read this account like this is what it takes something that's like almost airtight in thought to be like we if we're going to survive in this world we have to make like a perfect diamond of ideology to make it through and they did Mm mm-hmm well, guys, uh, I think that'll do it for the uh, n- the Mary Rowlandson narrative. If you enjoy this show, patreon.com slash literary hangover. Also check us out on YouTube. And can we do a, a quick kind of poll of listeners' interest in a potential Mary Rowlandson wilderness cookbook? Okay, yeah. If you're interested in that, <laughs> Kickstarter. We might try to get the Kickstarter up and running. <laughs> yeah, this is where Grace is going to announce that she's actually has a spinoff. <laughs> this is how you boil maggots out of horse flesh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's it's actually even more delicious than it sounds. Um, but do you guys want to plug your Twitter accounts? Oh yeah, 
the Twitter account that has lain fallow for two something months. Um, well, this would be a good argument for Grace to reactivate hers. Mm, no, you've been teasing Twitter yeah, lately. They've been I sending her links back. of all the all the funny things that are happening. All the memes. Um, yeah, my handle is Grace Jackson, all one word. And uh, I'm A L E C K. A L E C K S underscore G U N S. I I love when people think Alex with C K S is how you really spell it. Uh, honestly, if it if, edgy, if someone brings that up at my funeral, it'll have been a good life. I, w- I like to imagine your dad as somebody who would name a uh, child Alex with a C K S. Yeah, yeah, it's the maverick. Cool. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's just yeah, it's badass. Uh, and uh, I'm Matt Leck. <laughs> You probably already follow me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but thanks again, you guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, Grace, this is probably going to be your last one for a little bit. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's for, a, for at least six weeks. Well, maybe when you're back, we'll do uh, finish off Hope Leslie. Um, and maybe some more Henry James. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe four. Yeah. Four Henry James novels. <laughs> Just going to skip right past the Civil you. War. I'll okay. pitch that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we don't have to talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> and Margaret Fuller. Uh, we do need That's to do a, much more we, need to, we need to do a fuller episode, just exclusively Margaret Fuller. Um, all right, guys, thank you very much. Uh, we will be back in a couple weeks. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.